Harvard University senior year experience is a, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, Lynn Chanel of the alumni office has been the coordinator of the series of seminars that started earlier this month with the one about resume writing that continues today with the seminar about how to find the job that you want. And that continues with very helpful and free information. And, those of you, and I don't think it should just be seniors. But anybody can take advantage of this, and so I'm glad to see those of you who are here. Uh, my name is Howard Joppe, and I work as an adjunct in the Department of Communication and Journalism here. I teach courses like uh, uh, public relations and publicity methods for organizations, mass media, uh, speech communication, business communication. That, that's my area. I'm an attorney by training, uh, but I've made a career out of the television news and then a boutique communications firm, a high-end communications firm. And now lately, the last few years, I've been teaching, and I, I love doing that as well. This is, these are very hard times in many ways, but what I, I wanted to start this by actually changing the title of this seminar, because I don't think it's your future. The job search starts here, which I came up with originally. I think it's really more about get a job. Go get a job. Now's the time to do it, and there are ways to do it. And you know what? Wait, let me go even farther. Get a good job. I get very worried when times are difficult that people start to settle, and you shouldn't settle. You can figure out there are ways, there are tactics, and there are things you can do that will help you succeed and that will help you land exactly the position you're looking for. There's something very close to it. Does anybody know what? Um, Anybody know what 9.6 represents right now? Yeah, Unemployment, right? 9.6 is 9.6 percent. That's the number of people are out and we're looking right now. That's what they say. Those are federal numbers. 9.6 percent. But there are a lot of people who stopped looking. And there are a lot of people who have taken jobs that are well below where they just were. They might have been earning six figures, and now they are forced to take jobs that are paying much less or might be paying minimum wage. That number is considerably higher and a lot scarier in some ways. That number is 17%. I want to congratulate those of you who are graduating now because you are moving into the worst economy anybody alive can remember. And you can ask your parents and you can ask your grandparents. You know, it's just, it's a horror show out there in some ways, and it's, you know, it's very challenging in terms of everything we try to do. You know, I think there'll be people writing papers and treatises about this graduating class and these groups of classes, because it's not just 2011. <coughs> it was 2009, it, will be, it was 2010, it will be 11, and probably 12. That's just very difficult. And I don't know what the effect is going to be. You know, we come out of college with the degree, the degree, and the diploma, and we're sort of loaded. You know, it's like a rocket ship on the on the launch pad, loaded with solid rocket boosters, filled with the with, with the rocket fuel, and ready to go. And you know, when they go to hit ignition, three, two, one, ignition, liftoff, and there's no liftoff because there's no place to shoot to, there's no place to go to. Okay. People are out of work. Families are losing their homes. For the first time in generations, parents are worried that their children won't have the same quality of life, the same standard of living that they have. <coughs> Historically, in the United States, we've done better and better every generation. Our kids have always done better than we did. And this time, that's in, that, that, that's in question whether that's going to happen. And, and worst of all, this notion of the American dream, and whatever it is, because it's different for each of us. We don't all see this the same way. But it, it feels as if it's evaporating. It's vanishing. That's what we're up against now. Rocky, difficult times. Now, I want to point something out that I think is very important. We should stop whining about it. Because if 9.6% are out of work, it still means that most people, by and large, 8 out of 10 at least, are working, right? 
you have to keep the, a, a perspective on this. This is not 25% unemployment, it's not one in four. Imagine what that would feel like. There are countries and places and communities where that's it, not in this country. But this is, you know, there are a lot of people working. Many more people are working than are not working. That's one thing we should keep in mind so that we can, you know, have some hope going forward. People are hiring. They're always hiring. In the worst economies, there, there is a job out there. And it might be, Christine, it might be for you. It might be a job that's there for you. The one, you, you just need the one. You don't need a thousand jobs. You wouldn't be able to cover them. You can't do even four or five. You need one job. And I submit to you that that job is out there. It, the hard part is finding it. I want to also call it sort of, you know, suggest to you another point, and that is, it's not always like this. You happen to be coming of age at a time when it's this difficult. And we're on a good track. I do feel that a lot of the policies that the administration is taking so much heat over that they're, they're, they will take hold, but it's as the president said just recently, you know, it, it takes time to do some of this, longer than we thought. But I do want to encourage you, and I, I do want to suggest, hi, that we're on the right track, we are moving forward, and it will not always be like this. It gets better. You should not despair. You should not give up. You should not lose hope. Instead, you know what, go the other way. Let it energize you and let it challenge you to really find that right job, your job that's out there. I will tell you that getting the job is as much work as having a job. People lose that sometimes, but I want to remind you of that. And let me suggest one other thing. When I came out of college, a long time ago, my roommates had to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. They had to get dressed, shower, you know, shave, get ready, and put on a suit for an interview because the retailer, was only seeing the first five people. This was a Rutgers just down the street. They were only seeing five people. It was rough then too. We go through these periods. It's in the mid 70s. We go through these periods. And we're in one now, and this one is pretty severe, but we are, as I said, we are coming out of it. We do believe we've bottomed out. Very important to keep in mind, it is just, it's, this is temporary. In your lifetimes, things will get much, much better. We're capable of doing that. Times like these make us do strange things. They make us feel desperate. They make us abandon hope. And sometimes they make us take the first job we get because we're very fearful. I think that's a big mistake. But it's easy for me to say because I have two jobs. You have a right to find the job that you want. A job that makes you feel good, a job that inspires you, something that you're good at in an area that you are passionate about, that you care a lot about, you will be better at it. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we're going to take our time and deal with today. I, I think that, you know, when I see somebody who comes out of college and they want them, you know, filing insurance forms or doing something that's just, you know, God, it's not what they wanted, but they took the job because they felt they had to. I think it's a big mistake because you know what? You get yourself on a track. You do have to aim yourself in the right direction for what you want. In public relations, we talk about management by objective, this idea of knowing what you want to do, putting it out in front of you, and every move you make, every step you take is toward that goal, in that direction. We're capable of doing that, and it's a great technique to use when you're looking for a job. So let's explore this a little bit. First, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, do you, do you really want a job? Really? You know, mom and dad are there in this generation. They've always been there. But uh, other generations sort of graduated and left. This generation, a lot, of, a lot of people are coming back. And that's comfortable. That's easy. I like my old bedroom. I like back in the house. It's okay. I don't have to. I don't have to break any records now. It's a tough time. I'll wait it out. I'll go back home. I don't mind relaxing a little bit. I like being comfy cozy. <laughs> Did I mention comfy cozy? It's a big attraction. I see a lot of people doing this. I can't understand it. 
but I know a lot of people do it, and maybe some of you are doing it. It's whatever you choose. But I'm here to talk about if you really want to get that job, if you're serious about it, what it takes to do that, and how best to mechanize a search, how best to make that happen. The hardest part about finding a job is figuring out what you want to do. I am amazed by the number of people I talk to who are in college, moving through, juniors now, seniors now, graduating in a few months, who don't have a clue. It makes me appreciate that I knew as a, at an early age what I wanted to do. I want to be a TV newsman. It's fourth or fifth grade. I, was, I knew it. I watched it. I saw them. I, I had said I could do that. It looks like a pretty cool thing. And so I did everything from that point forward to achieve that because I thought I knew what I wanted to be, realistically. I mean, that was after firing and cowboy. And it was also when astronauts just were coming, you know, just starting around. So to be around. So yeah, I, I realized I was blessed to have a pretty good sense of what I wanted and a good understanding of my capabilities. Remember Clint Eastwood said, I think it was in uh, the first Dirty Harry at the end of the film, he said something, a man has got to know his limitations. A woman has got to know her limitations. We have to understand where we fit in. We have to understand what we're good at and what we're not good at. What we like to do and what we don't like to do. So Questions like this matter in order to help you find. How many people in the room know or think they know what they want to do? Tell me about that, please. Your name? Barbara. Barbara? I'm Barbara. I'm a product manager. A product manager. For what kind of industry? Perfume. Perfume. Interesting. You're probably the only one in the room going after that track. Right? Good for you. Who else knows? Who else thinks they know? Go ahead. Retail management. Retail management. Those were the jobs we were talking about. When they put on their suits, it was Abraham and Strauss at the time. Macy's, Abraham and Strauss, Bamberger's was around, Gimbel's was around. Big retailers. And that's what, uh, so that's an interesting area too. That's what Jerry Seinfeld's parents on the show always think you should have done. You should have done that program. Who else knows? Brittany knows. Uh, publicist for a major record label. Publicist for a major record label. Great. You're on the track to do that also. Who else knows? Christina knows. Pharmacy. Pharmaceutical marketing, great area. They give you a car. You know, all you have to do is sell drugs. <laughs> Samantha? Uh, graphic design for a high-end fashion magazine. Graphic design for high-end fashion. That's pretty cool. You know how to write it, so you So what else? Who else knows? It's Merit knows. Real estate and PR. You're selling real estate now, right? This is great. I didn't expect so many people to know because when I ask students, too many of them don't. They don't have a clue. And I do think that's the first step. I think we have to figure out what we want. We should give ourselves that chance, that opportunity. You know, what tickles us? What touches us in exactly that right place that gets us excited, that gets us motivated, that energizes us, that makes us want to get up and go to do something? I've had a couple of jobs like that. I like that. That's a great feeling. I've also had a couple of jobs that were not like that, and that's a very bad thing. To have to wake up each morning and go do something you don't want to do, you don't want it. You just don't want it. So these are things that you want to think about. How do you go about finding this now? I mean, how do we, how do we identify and then figure out what we want and how to get it? So research, as with anything, I'm very big on homework. We have uh, six or so people in the room who have uh, been students of mine. And you know how important that research phase is, certainly in public relations and in communications. But it's all the way through. Research, homework, you have to figure out if you don't know for sure what you want. And if you do know for sure, you must do the research to figure out the right route, the right path to take. There are a lot of different ways to get places, and they don't all take you to the exact place you want. So research is across the board, whether you know or whether you don't know. I always like to make a list of pros and cons. I like to figure out what I want to do, what I don't want to do. Like what? What are some things that work into a job that we have decisions about? Do I want to travel a lot? Or would I prefer not being in the airport all the time? I have a friend of mine, a couple of friends, who travel all the time. He's jogging in Colorado today. I mean, on Facebook, you update his Facebook thing, talk about there are bears walking and he's jogging by him. He flies all the time. 
I don't think I want it there. Do I want to work with people or would I rather work on my own? Do I love committees? Do I love meetings? Or am I pretty good as a lone wolf? And I, you know, I like to collaborate, but I don't need a million people around me all the time. These are decisions you can make. Hey, do I need to make a billion dollars? Or am I okay just making a million? Is it okay if I can pay rent or pay mortgage and take care of my bills, take care of my family, keep everybody fed? Or do I really need the yachts? Do I really need the diamonds? There are all kinds of choices. And we don't stop and think about them enough. And there are a million other things for those lists. So I encourage all of you, even those of you who think you know and might very well know which way you're headed, to come up with, uh, you know, s to think about some of the basics, because that will inform the kind of job you get. Where you go look for the specific, which retailer you go to, there are big ones and small ones. You know, what kind of a fashion house you decide, you, you decide that you're, you're going to be working for. You know, is it Jimmy Choo or Christian Louboutin, or is it one of the, you know, haute couture, you know, dress, robe, you have choices. In music, I mean, the whole spectrum. From rap and hip hop and gangster rap back to classical music and pop music and <coughs> country music. I like these lists of pros and cons at work. And you know what, talk to people. Talk to me, talk to your colleagues, talk to friends, talk to your parents, talk to your parents' friends, people you're related to. Talk about it, things that interest you, things that interest them. See where there's common ground, see what's there. You get a lot from talking to people. I mean, you know, if you pick the right people, I mean, that's always, it's always, that's the challenge to be able to do that. But I, I don't want you to forget to take advantage of the resources we literally have at our fingertips every single day. People, students, you got a room full of people here, room full of students. Research. We talked about it. So what do you do? You can look at the marketplace. You can check out what's going on in the industry you're interested in. Things do change. The art industry changes, the automobile industry changes, the pharmaceutical industry changes. They are not constant, they don't stay the same. I like the idea of staying up on trends. And there was a big trend list that came out last week. Alvin Toffler who wrote a book we talked about in class called Future Shock. A number of years ago, his people issued a list of trends just a couple of weeks ago. You should take a look at them. Alvin Topfer, T-O-F of L-E-R, Future Shock. And if you Google Future Shock Trends, you'll be able to find this. It's good to know where things are headed. Faith Popcorn, which we talked about in class also, one of the original futurists, one of the original trend announcers. She had a great firm in New York, a number one Madison Avenue. It was called Brain Reserve. She's older now. Faith, her name was Faith Plotkin, but she was popularized as Faith Popcorn. And she came up, they generated every year, they do the top 10 trends, and a few years she did a few of them on the head. And those trends led to businesses that did not exist before. When she talked about cocooning, she was the one who, I think she's the one who came up with the term, but you know, we kind of uh, lost our jobs, we're out of corporate life, we're at home now, we're sort of building this little safety net around us, and we have to work at home. So there are things that we had at our corporate job that we don't have at all. Like paper, like envelopes, like office supplies, like copiers. So there are companies like Staples and Office Max that came out, FedEx, DHL, UPS, all those overnight, absolutely overnight has to be, that came out of that. That was people who kept an eye on what was going on and figured out if that's the trend, how do we maximize it? Trends are, I don't know if there are any surfers in the room. When you surf, you need to be on top of the wave. You need to ride the crest of the wave. If you're too far back, you're sinking. If you're too far front, you get killed. You gotta be right on the crest of the wave as it breaks. That's how trends are. If you try to go against trends, you're gonna be swimming upstream. Don't think you can do that. There are trends and you have to sort of go with them, but they're good to know what they are. She had another one called small indulgences. People couldn't afford the big things. They couldn't afford the trips to Cannes in the south of France. But they could afford small indulgences. Chocolate covered cherries. Candles that smell pretty. Nice bath bombs. Well, Bed Bath Bed, Bed, and Beyond happened. Stores like that came out. Borders and Noble, Barnes and Noble started selling things like that. You have to watch these trends, very important, because they are universal. And when somebody identifies them when they're right, you better hang on. That's where you want to be. 
We talked, I just mentioned Barnes and uh, Barnes and Noble and Borders. I love going through the stats. I love seeing, you know, you, you can see what people are reading. You can see it in the New York Times on Sunday, the New York Times bestseller list, the book review. You can just look for trade books, for, for uh, popular books, fiction, nonfiction, and see what people are reading. That tells you what they're thinking about. That tells you where, the, where our heads are. There's sometimes when it's very heavy with self-help books, and sometimes when it's very heavy with history. You have to look at these things. It's very helpful to know. I love walking through borders and through the magazine area and looking at magazines from all over the world in different languages and seeing what they put on their covers. What are they talking about? What new technologies? What new movements? What new businesses? There are a lot of jobs around today that were not around 10 years ago. I mean, you know, digital technology, microchips, all of that, I mean, obviously, it changed everything. You're lucky to be living now through this. I'm lucky to be living through it also. But uh, for me, there was a transition. Because before 1984, uh, there was no personal computer. That's when Apple came out with this, its first one. So I go to Barnes & Noble and just browse sometimes. I just see what people are up to, what they're reading, what's making news. I do check job postings. I don't respond to them. I never used to respond to them. But I do take a look because you can also, well, where are people hiring? What kind of jobs are they looking for? Where do I fit into this? And there's some great online tools that help you do this, starting with places like Craigslist. The mass media. Are you watching TV news? Are you watching what's making it? Are you watching the kinds of shows that are breaking records now? The Dancing with the Stars and the American Idol and the Thinks, uh, the thinks You Have Talent or the, uh, all of these. These reality competitions, very big right now. They did not used to exist. The reality show as a genre itself only came in a few years ago. Did not used to exist. It's a new form. So it's interesting what that shows. It's interesting what you pull out of that. And that's why you have to just sort of, you know, you have to observe. You have to keep your eyes open and your ears open and you have to observe. A law school professor, first day of school, Elements of Civil Procedure was the name of the book. I didn't even understand the name of the book. That, that's how much trouble I was in on my first day of law school. I did not even understand what this book was about, but it was very heavy and I knew I had to have it. But he gave us a great image that I have so many years later about how you absorb some of this kind of information. He said it's like lying naked at the edge of the shore. And every time a wave comes in and breaks, you get wet and then it recedes, it ebbs. And then another wave comes in and it breaks on you and then it pulls back. And you know, after a few waves, you're soaked. You've, you've, you've adopted it, you've gathered it, you're, you're absorbing it. And it's like that with these big sort of cosmic flows of information that we do have to be plugged into through mass media, through the bookstores and what people are reading, through those trends, through what the marketplace is doing. Where are they hiring? Where are they firing? What's contracting? What's expanding? Even in lousy times, there are businesses that aren't expanding. Bankruptcy law is not a bad place to be right now. Things you have, to, you have to just sort of keep an eye on where things are headed that way. So, I always suggest to my students, for all the right reasons, to stay calm. Read a damn newspaper. Read your hometown paper. You don't have to do it in print. If you don't want to hold it, you don't have to. You can go online. Most of these publications are available. But for heaven's sake, you've got to know what's going on in the world. You need that for interviews, too. You need that to write cogent cover letters. You need to know what's going on. You should be following major stories. And some minor ones also. There's an election year. There's a huge election day next Tuesday, a week from today, November 2nd. You're all old enough to vote? Is everybody registered to vote? I hope those of you who are registered to vote will vote. It's a huge midterm election. And there's an awful lot at stake, as there always is in these election days. Do your homework. Do what you have to do to really get yourself to a place where you feel confident that you know enough about what's going on to be able to walk in and talk to anybody about something. I was a TV news anchor man and a reporter for a while, for about a dozen years. That trick to that trade, I know this much about a ton of things. A thousand million subjects, I'm about a half an inch deep in. But I'm great at cocktail parties. I'm great at interviews. I can talk to people. 
people about just about anything they come up with. I can come up with something that relates. You want to be like that. It makes you a better candidate. It makes you a better citizen of the world, and you have more fun. So many great issues. What do they say? It's not what you know. It's Oh, come on, all together, bless you. Mary, you should sneeze as my mother used to, to punctuate a true statement, right? The sneeze means the truth. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Okay. That's very true. It's also what you know. It is also what you get out of a college experience like this one or Meyer University. It is what you get out of your church or your synagogue or your mosque. It is what you get out of your family dinners and everything else that you do as you're growing up. There is a lot to know, and you have to know a lot, but it also helps to know a few people. And I think it's never too early to establish relationships. Getting a job is about relationships. Much more often than looking at a job posting and having you know, somebody respond to a resume, much more often, if you find a job you want, I bet you can find a way to get in. I bet you can check a board of directors and see who knows who, or see who went to Ryder, or who has a common, you know, who's also a, a, a subscription holder at the Philadelphia Orchestra. Some commonality that lets you make a connection that might pull you into a job. It is who you know. It's never too early, and I hope you've been making good relationships, establishing yourself, putting together little networks and bigger networks, <coughs> your little solar systems. I hope you've been doing this for a long time, but I didn't really think to do it until I was, I think, past college. It never kind of occurred to me. I had my friends, you know, but to do it to get a job, you better be doing it now. You better be doing it five years ago. You start right now, if not. And here's some ways to go about it, okay? I always ask, you know, who loves you? I mean, who loves you? I don't mean specific names. I mean who in your circle? Your parents, right? Your family. Your friends, if they're friends. <coughs> People you've worked with. Colleagues. Whether at an internship or at a job. If you're in sororities, your, your sisters. If you're in fraternities, your brothers. If you're on sports teams, your teammates. There are a lot of people who love you, who care about you. And if they care about you, they are going to want to help you. They would naturally want to help you. Why wouldn't they? If they don't, I mean, what kind of friends are they? So what your job is then is what? With regard to them, this group? Networking. Well, networking and what else? Keeping in touch. Keeping in touch. Yeah, I mean, give them a chance to help. They have to know that you need something and that maybe they can do something for you. <coughs> and there's a way to go about that too. We'll get to that. But you have to let them know. And enlist their help. Friends, family, sorority, fraternity, sisters, brothers, teammates, employees, current and former. That's why you don't burn bridges when you leave. Even if you want to do something nasty, you don't. Because it's ridiculous. You should never do it. I left my first job in TV in Norfolk, Virginia. Well, I went to Miami. My news director in Norfolk, Virginia walked in the door three weeks later as the assistant news director at my station in Miami. I'm glad we left on great terms and hugged and kissed him. Because it would have been horrible for me to go to another job and then have somebody come in who I can't stand. Never burn bridges. It's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes we leave jobs and it's not terrific. <laughs> Something happened, I just saw it in the eyebrows again. That's right. So that's right. Yeah, that left, but that's all right. Your colleagues and your teachers. I tell all of my classes, and I hope my colleagues here tell their classes too. Whatever we can do to help, I'm glad to do. If that's letters of reference, if that's uh, go look at my friends on Facebook, I keep it open so you can see their connections, check LinkedIn. I'm glad to help, and I hope other people who are teaching you are saying the same thing. It does, as President, as uh, Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, when she wrote in her book, she said it takes a village. It's like that for job hunting, also. It's not a, it's not a solitary pursuit. It takes your resources. It takes the people that, that who are around you who can really help. So that's about mobilizing your real life community. Those are real people. Let them know how you're doing it. Some of you suggested this already. I like the idea of periodic email updates. 
I like putting together distribution lists of people. Don't put too many on it because you don't want to wind up in spam folders. But you know, if you come up with 20 or 30 or 40 people, maybe break them into groups of two, blind copy everybody so that everybody doesn't see who else you're sending to. And if you blind copy, it can appear as if you're just sending to them. So you don't write things like, I want to let all of you know. It's make it individual, make it individual. That works. A good subject line and a good update, short. So if they open or wherever their mail server opens on the screen, whatever that looks like, you don't have to scroll. They just, just have it open and write this because that, they'll see it, they'll get the idea. And if you have something specific that you want to find out about, I mean, I get a note from somebody, and I want anybody know anybody at Comcast? Well, Comcast employs thousands of people. I wouldn't even respond to that other than maybe to say, do you want to kind of refine and narrow the search so maybe somebody has a clue how we might be able to help you? Do you need somebody in human resources? Do you need somebody in accounting? Do you need somebody in the executive suites? Do you need somebody in public relations or marketing or government affairs or production or on the, uh, what are their networks? You know, whether they have the, um, um, not the fright thing, the uh, like the scary, oh, they have, one of my friends actually works for them out in Los Angeles, uh, Comcast. And they'll have a lot more now that they took NBC. You have to be specific. If you have an area you want to work in, you call somebody or you write in your note, you know, I am looking at a position at Comcast in the uh, marketing division. Uh, apparently, they're looking for somebody with my experience to sell subscriptions in Montgomery County. I'm making it up. But be specific, because that way I know where to begin. At least that way I can think, well, you know what, I do know people there. Maybe, you know what, call this one. I'll make a call for you. And then you call or I'll email it. You start to mechanize it. But you have to be specific. I wouldn't send this update out every two minutes, but once a month isn't too much. You're not gonna annoy anybody if they're a friend if you send out something periodically. You're not hammering them every two minutes. It's very helpful. Keep it short, always nice and sweet, and it can be personal regards if you want or whatever. And on that email, you know what I think you should also do? I, you do something I do on my mail. Let me just see if I can get out of here and get here fast. I, um, my mail has a signature on it. On my mail, everything goes out with that. So it's my key messages, my name, my key messages, what our core capabilities are for my, my business, of my contact information, phone number, email. And I also put this, the last few years, I've been putting down where else they can find me. I think that does a few things. It does bring people in to, on, to your social networking side, which gives you more opportunity, you know, more ways to reach out to people. But it also kind of indicates that you're sort of, you know, with it, that you're into it. It might be more important for me at my age and in my generation, because it might be taken for granted with you, but I, there are a lot of you who aren't on Twitter right now, and you probably should be. There are a lot of you who are not in LinkedIn, you definitely should be. I assume everybody's doing Facebook, everybody's on Facebook now. And some others are telling me that I'm in your lobby. But when you send out that mail, make sure your signature is on there. And you have stuff you can say. And it could be about, it could be writer, you know, uh, uh, cl you know class of t uh, 2011. It could be, you know, uh, astronomy major. It could be a variety of things. But your, or just your basic contact information. Forget everything else, just put your name and then go down and do this stuff. But I like the idea of a signature. It's cleaner, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's uh, matters also. I think it helps the receiver know, <laughs> assuming that they get down there and they have a chance to see it. The thing about sending a note to somebody and asking them to do something is that you burn, they burn what's known as political capital. There are certain people for certain purposes, I can't call them every day. I need to be careful when I call them so I don't overuse the welcome. I might have access to the senior vice president, executive vice president of Comcast, but I don't want to be calling David every five minutes. I'm burning political capital. The people you're going to be contacting have the same issue. That's why you want to be specific in what you're asking them to do. And, and you're allowed to follow through if you don't hear back. 
how are we doing? You call them back next week and make a phone, whatever it is. You don't have to just, you know, make the pitch and let it go and, well, if I hear back, fine. If not, not. No, it's okay for you to follow up. Did you have a chance to call? What do you think of that? Am I going about it the right way? I need some help. You know, it's very good. You can call people all the time and you're not asking them for jobs. You might ask them for guidance. You might ask them for some direction. I do that all the time and I do it now, let alone when I'm on your age just coming out of college or in college. And by the way, everything we're talking about here is not only for permanent jobs when you graduate, it's also for the interstitial internships, your spring, fall, summer internships. All of this goes for both of those things. Mobilizing your online community. That's what we're talking about now. We talked about your real life community, your friends and family, your colleagues, all of that. Now we're talking about your online community, okay? Raise your hand if you're on Facebook. Raise your hand if you're on, uh, if, if, if you signed into Foursquare. Me neither. Nobody? Me neither. I'm trying to figure that one out. I don't know if I need it. Tumblr, who's doing Tumblr? New great thing, blogs, and you're writing on it? Yeah, it's I working. do like music review, new music review. Cool. You getting any pickup on it? Um, it's mostly, right now, it's just people that I know who are reading it and responding to it. I don't know if any strangers are looking at it. I mean, the thing about social networking, and we talked about it in class, you know, when, when you set your privacy settings, and we're going to talk about them in a minute too, when you set your privacy settings to friends of friends on Facebook, you know what I'm talking about? There's a friends of friends category. They assume we have 950 friends each. That's what the average is. I don't know where they got it. Well, they got that, I'm sure, from the hard evidence. So it's 950 times 950. That's the number of people you're reaching. Your capability is something like, I, 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 it's the number 26.5 or 29.5, thousands. That friends versus friends is a very big community. So if your friends are seeing this and if they start to forward something or send something or retweet something, you're reaching out there much farther than you can do on your own. That's a great advantage and it comes with some of these platforms. Um, Twitter we talked about. Tumblr, well, Twitter I didn't talk about. Twitter started uh, older and pushed down to you. Facebook started you and pushed up to us. And now we're actually a majority, we're something like 67% who's on there on Facebook. It's one of the reasons why I think you're all gonna be running somewhere else soon. I'd like to know where that is so that we can I can stay with it because I teach it. But I think you're gonna be, leave, people will be leaving Facebook soon for something else. I think MySpace. That's something else. Well, MySpace got so cluttered, yeah. and MySpace was also built for a whole other reason. MySpace was built as a platform for independent bands, something that was still just when it started taking money a few years ago, they were been able to develop. Um, Craigslist, LinkedIn, you must be on. LinkedIn is a place to post resumes, profiles. You can ask questions <coughs> your online community. You can, you can bring people in. It, it's great. You can find people you might need, people you might be applying to, or somebody else who works there. LinkedIn is a fabulous resource. By the way, all of these are free. Chatterlet, I'm joking now. Because Chatterlet's there really for a whole other reason. It's a very friendly site. There are an awful lot of, apparently, there are an awful lot of guys on Chatterlet who wave to you as you go by. Yeah. There's a lot of that on Chatterlet, but that's not a place for careers and jobs. I'm just, I just want to throw it in because I figured you might be aware of it. Um, Craig's, Craigslist. You know what? Both of my sons, my sons are 27 and 23, both of them found their dream jobs on a Craigslist ad, on a Craigslist post. Unbelievable. And they're serious jobs. One is a talent agent in one of the big three talent agencies in New York and the other one is working for a fabulous startup, which you should write down because you can have some fun with this. Breakoutband.com. Breakoutband is uh, hitting this fall a little bit later. Um, don't dismiss some of these resources. If you know how to search, if you know how to put an engine out there in terms of keywords and things you might be looking for, contract work, permanent work, whatever you're looking for, whatever area, whatever industry, Craigslist is pretty damn good at it. And you don't know what's posted there. I mean, I'm telling you, a serious shot. Uh, my older son, it was four interviews out of that end. It was a very rigorous human resources process, extreme, like the CIA. And I don't mean the Culinary Institute of America, I mean the, the real city. But it started on Craigslist. And, Melissa, and my younger son, Jonathan, his job, the genesis, was on Craigslist. 
it morphed into what he now has. But don't dismiss these things. These are great resources. I wish we had these way back when. They're just, they're fabulous. You need to mobilize your online communities. Now, th there are a variety. We don't, I don't have any, I have 15 minutes. Okay, I don't have questions too. It has never been easier to network online or offline. You want to meet people. You can join groups, but you don't have to. You can monitor groups. I'm not, I don't join every group. But you can find, if you do a search on Facebook, and you're all familiar with it, you do a search of groups, you can find people who are in industries that you might be interested in. People might be able to help you or make a match up. You find somebody new. You can post queries on LinkedIn, and I think on Facebook to some extent, but just by your post, you can put questions. Does anybody know, has anybody had influence, uh, uh, does, has anybody worked here? What's the corporate culture like at this place? You can post things like that. That's LinkedIn. Facebook requires acceptance. If I, if I, uh, if I message, if, if I invite Christina to be a friend, she has to accept. That's all across the board on Facebook, no matter what your settings are. Um, on Twitter, it's different. On Twitter, you can just follow somebody. They learn about it with an email if they have their settings set for that. But you don't need their permission, except in some cases. Some people have closed their Twitter accounts, except for they, they want to be able to uh, you know, bring in or not bring in as they want. But I have an issue with some of this, because I'm thinking you know, the whole purpose of this stuff, the whole purpose of these social networking platforms is to be more expansive, to be more out there. I mean, I have my settings wide open. I just don't put anything on there. I don't want everybody to see. There are 500 million people on Facebook. I assume they're all looking at my stuff. Any one of them can look at my stuff. I don't have anything posted that I don't want. You should clean up your pages, by the way. You should check that stuff out because people will be looking. They'll be doing their research, their due diligence. And as I've said to classes many times, I don't think it's, you know, uh, people in bathing suits or bikinis or having fun at parties, but I think if you're going to post a picture of yourself going to the bathroom, that's something else. That's a judgment issue. And I see plenty of it on these posts. I don't understand them. I didn't know when that became the style. But employers might look at that and might wonder, well, what kind of judgment are they showing if they're doing that? Is that somebody that we want working here? So I would say to go in and scour but reasonably, you can still have fun. But I think you do that better than close down settings. Some people have it such that you can't do anything. You can hardly see anything except for their friends. I think it defeats the purpose of these programs. With safety in mind, with stalkers and, and, and you know, <coughs> problems, after, no question. But within that realm, I think these things, you know, I don't think you're using them for the fullest unless you allow some of what they're supposed to do to happen. You meet people online just as in the real world. It's like dating, finding a job. It's like looking for the right guy or looking for the right girl. You sort of have to know where to go to do it. Am I going to find the person I'm looking for in a bar or a bowling alley? Am I going to find that person at a gun shop? Maybe. Maybe. Might I find them at a political fundraiser? Might I find them at some uh, church event? Might I find them at a movie? You have to really think about this because you know we don't all go to the same place. You want to at least improve your odds, no? Of finding the right people to make the right match. It's exactly like that with jobs. I mean, don't be looking where your job ain't going to be. It doesn't make any sense to do it. I think it's a good idea to get involved. And I also don't think it's too early to do that. In your social groups, if you're raising money for pediatric leukemia, if you're doing something for the church fundraiser, if you're doing a fundraiser for a sorority, to get involved, to do something, work on a political campaign, help kids, you know, sick kids, big brothers, big sisters. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of things to do. You know what? When you do them, you meet good people. You meet people who know other people. You're expanding your network even more. You're doing some good. You're helping your community. You're fulfilling some of those things that Dr. Abraham Maslow, whom we talk about in COM 240 and in COM 341, publicity methods, the psychologist who came up with the list of things that really motivate us. 
So we know what audiences are motivated by. So we understand what motivates ourselves. And there are things that you understand immediately, instinctively. Security, food, shelter, clothing, that motivates us. Need for respect, that motivates us. A need for wealth, that motivates us. A need for love, a need for belonging, a need for feeling that you've been <coughs> Why do you think people sit on these boards of directors? Why do you think they go to these endless meetings for every organization? There's that sense of belonging. There's that sense of contributing to your community. It's a great thing, and I encourage you to do it. Often people wait until after college. You shouldn't wait. You should do it as soon as you can. Get involved. How many, se how many seminars are there in the, in the, uh, the rider, senior, year experience. How many? Ten. Ten seminars. This will be the only one that has the word puke in. Okay? This is just a little thing about networking, okay? When you go to parties, when you meet other people, when you're at cocktail receptions, when you're at the museum for the preview shows, when you're meeting Senator Menendez at a dinner, I used to run up to them and tell them everything about myself as fast as I could and give them everything about my life as we know I know here's my card. And that's not the way to do it. Of course it's not the way to do it. How do you do it? You don't puke. You meet somebody, you stand with them, and you talk to them. And you hear from them. That leads you. That gives you an idea of which way I can go with this. You hear that she does this for a living. Well, I wonder if you know this one. And if, you, if I were looking at something that it's just down the block from you, you're, you're in Englewood and they're in team. You never know where these connections happen. And if you have a business card to give out, and you could very well, because you go down and print it, probably not a bad idea, even as graduates, fresh graduates. At some point, there's an exchange. It's not the puke. Very important point. I wish I'd learned that earlier. I went, I went too many years not really getting that. <coughs> and then you just go and you shoot. You, it's, it's not, there's a better way to network. And that's why I put that in here. I want to just remind you. When you are, I think when you're online, you should start thinking about bolstering your presence there. It should be more apparent. And again, all this stuff is free, or most of it's free. Every, I think everything I'm talking about is, you should update regularly. You should update your posts regularly, and they should be creative. I was just reading an article this morning about uh, people are unfriended on Facebook for two basic reasons. Either they said something that's really at an extreme in religion or politics, or you're sick of hearing how many times their baby rolled over. People post things that are just like, did you get that one? No, I don't be creative. You can talk about the news. You can talk about something important to you. You can get people wondering and thinking. My posts, I, I like, I always look for something that can be interpreted different ways so people never really know what I'm talking about unless it's something very specific. We can have some fun with that. And I have some friends in the room who are online with me who are Facebook friends of mine, and you can attest to it. Be creative. Let yourself exercise a little bit. Update regularly, post creatively, write freely, clean thoroughly. That's the scouring part. And I would, again, I would check the privacy settings on all of them, but especially on Facebook, because they're very complicated. <coughs> you got to take them in pieces. And the system automatically resets certain times. Sometimes they announce it, sometimes they don't. So it's always a good idea to go in and just sort of make sure that the people you want to see certain things, if you have those sorts of things on there, can and nobody else. But again, my philosophy on this is a little bit more liberal. I, I think if you're going to put something on there, just make it so anybody can see it. I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me if everybody in this room went all over my site. There's nothing you would see that would bother me, or that would bother you. I don't try. I try not to be offensive with anything I say. I try not to be obviously, you know, take take positions that are, you know, I try to be true to myself. <coughs> But all of this is great networking. All of this gets it going for you and helps you. It expands the pool of people who might be in a position to help you. And that's what the goal is. I say reach out and touch someone. And when you do, you don't always ask for something. You know what? You can send somebody an article. I do this all the time. A friend of mine or one of my clients high up, I knew that she had done a trip to Ireland last year. 
And Sunday, the New York Times, the cover story was Ireland. So I went online, I got the article, and I just shot it to her with a one-word message called, the, I, I think I wrote remnants, 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 rem uh, remembrances of the trip. And she loved it. I didn't ask her for anything. I wasn't asking for a job, I wasn't asking for a new project, nothing. I was touching her though. I was getting in front of her. For that moment, she thought about Howard. Sometimes that's all I want. Sometimes that's all I need. And you can do that with anybody, any of your colleagues, in the real estate business, in the fashion industry, in the pharmaceutical business, in the retail, you can do all of this stuff. And it's easy. Send them an article, forward an interesting email, comment on their post. I do that every now and so often. Go. Okay, five, two minutes, how do I make friends? That's a whole idea today. It's just sort of don't hesitate. I want to be able to take questions, so I'm going to actually run through this last part. Uh, let me quick remind you, very important interview, we're at the end. When you get the interview for a job, they think you can do it. I don't know why nobody tells you that. They think you can do it. That interview is about something else. You don't have to prove yourself so much. You have to have a relationship. The interview is about whether or not they want to live with you 24-7 and sit next to you in a cubicle and smell you and hear you and deal with you 24-7. That's usually what the interview is. Before I do any interview, I research like crazy. I Google everybody. I find out where they went to school, what philanthropies do they support, what boards are they on, because I want stuff to talk about with them. If I walk into their office, I look at what kind of things I have on the wall. Does he have a golf statue? Is there a fishing head someplace? You know, I want to know who I'm dealing with. And you'd be surprised and you can find a lot of stuff out about people. So you have a relationship. Your leverage is like this. It's not like this in these interviews. You're there because you can help them. They have a need. That's why they're looking for the position and they're looking to fill it. And people forget about that. They go into these interviews and they sit down and in their best suit and they sit like this and they sit like little school kids. And I don't think that's how you get the job. And I'm not saying be arrogant or have an attitude, or as they say in Philadelphia, an attitude. I'm just saying you can go in and have a conversation. You know what? You're grown-ups. And remember, you're there to help them. They have a pain, and they have to ease the pain. The pain is that this, this seat's been empty. They need to fill it. And while that seat empty, is empty, everybody else is working harder. They have to cover those hours. They have to do extra jobs. They need you. So when you walk into an interview, don't forget that. Have a conversation. Ask questions, and you make sure whether it's a good match. What happens if they say yes, and you say, Oof, I don't know? doesn't feel like that's the culture that I'm looking for. You have to be able to make that decision also. We talked about preps. I just said to Google, everybody study the website, learn the industry, understand hobbies, where do they go to school, things that you can talk about, you'd be surprised. And then the only thing I'd say at this point is now go out and get the freaking job. Thank you very much for your attention. Give yourselves a hand.